your Excellency Vice President Kwesi Bekwe Emisa Arthur and Mrs. Matilda Emisa Arthur, your Ladyship, the Chief Justice, your Excellency, former President Jerry John Rawlings, and former First Lady Nana Konedu Ajiman Rawlings, your Excellency, former President John Ajekun Kufuor, Your Excellency, Mrs. Lordina Mahama, wife of the President, our special guest, Your Excellency, the Vice President of the Islamic Republic of Iran, Your Excellencies, our special guest, envoys from Algeria, and Zimbabwe, Your Excellencies, participants of the 8th Pan-African Congress taking place here in Accra, Dr. Chris Kirubi, former Honorary Consul of Ghana in Kenya, members of the Diplomatic Corps, our service chiefs and commanders, our gallant men and women in uniform, our future ladies, the, our future leaders, the school children, fellow Ghanaians. Let me begin by congratulating our security personnel and our school children for the smart and impressive turnout this morning. This morning's display is a manifestation of what we can do if we work together towards a common objective of national transformation. This year, we have reformatted the parade to reduce the pressure on our school children who in the past have had to stand on parade for a couple of hours in the scorching sun. This year, the children here have come onto the parade ground only at the time they were required to begin the march past and receive the presidential acknowledgement. After the march past, they have deservedly resumed their seats in the stand to my right and are taking a well-deserved rest. Despite this, I notice that still quite a number of our young brothers and sisters had to be stretched off the field due to exhaustion. This should give us an idea of how tough the duty of our servicemen and women are. Also for the first time, our traditional masquerading groups have had the opportunity to participate in this celebration. The reformatting of this year's parade means that we can think outside the box and change things for the better. Even the display by the security services, the rappelling from the helicopter and the fly past has been more exciting and has given us a glimpse into what they have to go through to defend the territorial integrity and the safety and security of our nation. Of course, the march past by the Special Forces has always been a favorite with Ghanaians. I wish on behalf of all Ghanaians to thank the security services, the school children, and the members of the National Planning Committee for all the work you have put into planning and successfully executing this national celebration. Our nation is 58 years old today, and not very far from here, the founding father of our nation, Osajifo Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, pronounced the famous words, at long last, the battle has ended. 
and thus Ghana, your beloved country, is free forever. 58 years on, we have a varied report card to show. Watching a popular television station news program yesterday, people were being asked what their opinions were about 58 years of Ghana's independence. I watched the man who was interviewed first, and he said there was no need to celebrate our independence because he did not believe that we had achieved anything in the 58 years of freedom. And he cited the power outages as a justification for his conclusion. This was followed by a very noble lady whose opinion was that we have cause to celebrate because we have chalked some successes and that if we continue to work together, we can build on those achievements. Fellow countrymen and women, these were different personalities, different genders, arriving at different conclusions. Of course, if you ask my opinion, I will side with the woman. First, because women traditionally are credited with a sense of intuition, and that is why in our traditional king's court, when they have been unable to resolve an issue, they refer it to the old lady, Abrewa. They say, Yenko Bisa Abrewa. It is often said. Secondly, it is also known that all individuals and nations that have achieved greatness have celebrated both their success and their failures. Their successes so that they can build on them and their failures so that they will never repeat them anymore. 58 years in our history, we have made mistakes and we have chalked many successes. We must celebrate and enhance our successes and recognize and minimize our failures. All of us have contributed to our collective history and would be a critical factor in whether we succeed or we fail as a nation. I dare say that notwithstanding any mistakes we may have made, our nation today is celebrated for our strong democracy, our respect for human rights, our freedom of expression, our ethnic harmony, and above all, our religious tolerance. And that is why I've recently been worried about a few events that have affected the atmosphere of ethnic and religious peace that we have enjoyed. I'm sure that our society has the absorbers to withstand these shocks, and that is why my heart was gladdened when I noticed the unanimity exhibited in the recent demonstration held in support of equal citizenship. The participation of various personalities in this demonstration indicates that on both sides of the political divide, we are resolved not to allow ourselves to be divided by ethnic or regional sentiments. <coughs> I'm absolutely encouraged by this show of solidarity by our young politicians on the issue of national unity. Each and every one of us in our ethnic and cultural diversity contributes in a unique way to make our nation great and strong. <coughs> our diversity must therefore, as I said in the State of the Nation Address, be a source of strength and not a weakness. Our diversity should be harnessed and forged into a potent weapon for the realization of our national interests. They should not provide the grounds for tearing ourselves apart. My brothers and sisters, I also note that on the issue of religious relations that I sought to clarify as president during my State of the Nation address, a citizen of our nation has headed to the Supreme Court to seek an interpretation of the relevant clauses of our Constitution. We will all await the highest court of the land to discharge its mandate. But I wish to indicate 
that government is not averse to the use of interfaith channels and dialogue to resolve any disagreements among our different faith groups. I have therefore only yesterday asked the National Commission for Civic Education to join the National Peace Council in initiating a dialogue to foster an amicable understanding on how to operationalize Article 21 one of our Constitution. Ladies and gentlemen, this is without prejudice to any conclusion the Supreme Court of our land would arrive at in respect of the suit brought before it. Fellow Ghanaians, assuming without accepting that we have achieved nothing in our 58 years of existence as a nation, one thing the whole world recognizes and accepts about Ghana is that we are an oasis of peace, democracy, religious, and ethnic tranquility. This is such a beautiful asset we cannot allow anyone to take away from us. We cannot sacrifice our Ghanaian character of ethnic and religious harmony on the altar of political bigotry. Multi-party democracy is not synonymous with enmity and division. It rather offers a melting pot for the exchange of ideas. Party politics is disadvantageous if all it leaves in its wake is intractable differences and a lack of consensus on any and every national subject. Belonging to different political organizations is no reason why we cannot work together to achieve solutions to our common challenges. I wish to declare emphatically that for me, no amount of political power is worth plunging this country into partisan, ethnic, or religious strife. I pledge to continue to do all in my power to promote an atmosphere of political rapprochement in order to diffuse any tensions that may threaten our national well-being, and I expect that all political leaders in this country will do the same. My fellow citizens, our world is changing and becoming increasingly unpredictable. Last year, we were all drenched by a sudden thunderstorm during this same independence celebration at this same venue, the Black Star Square. It was highly unusual to have a thunderstorm of that magnitude at this time of the year. And yet, because of the phenomena of climate change, this year we have already had two thunderstorms even earlier in the month of February. Happily, today our meteorological services have assured us that our celebration is not likely to be marred by a rainstorm. It is not only our climate that is changing, our demographics are changing, our politics is changing. We must therefore change our attitudes and our ways of doing things. I call for a rejuvenation of our national psyche from one that focuses on fleeting challenges and discounts successes chalked over the years to one that embraces greater and sustained efforts towards national transformation. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no substitute for hard work and discipline. Let us always consider it an honor to be chosen to work for our country. Let the message therefore go forth to all our youth that your success in academic pursuits and life in general is contingent on your willingness to embrace hard work and discipline. These are time-tested values that have seen many grow into men and women of valor and substance. Our youth are like he healthy seeds, and all the investments that our parents and governments make in their education and upbringing are the water and the nurturing required for these seeds to germinate. After germination, you are expected to blossom into responsible men and women prepared to take over the affairs of this great land of ours long after we, your parents and grandparents, have departed this earth. Ghana's future depends on you, and I'm confident that the youth of Ghana will rise to this challenge. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the 50th anniversary that we mark today as a free and independent country has only been made possible and relevant because for centuries, others before us were willing to do whatever it took to free us from colonial bondage. That journey towards self-rule is characterized by epoch-making events from which we should draw inspiration for our own march towards socioeconomic transformation. I was born in 1958, just a year after independence was attained. My wife, Lodina, also a post-independence Ghanaian, was born on the 6th of March, 1963. Like many of you gathered here and elsewhere, the great stories of our independence struggle were passed on to us through oral tradition and accounts documented by our historians. Our history of resistance and liberation is spiced with the stories of courage and sacrifice by many. Ya Asantua, Sergeant Ajete, Corporal Atipo, Private Odate Lamte, Ni Kobna Boni, Osajifu Dr. Nkrumah, the Big Six, and countless others sacrificed for our independence. These are people who took a stand for us, and today we continue to reap the fruits of their sacrifice. Their contribution and their place in history is assured. But the question we must ask is, how will history remember our generation when our story comes to be written? Will we be remembered as a generation that took a stand for our nation, or one that threw up its arms in despair and buckled in the face of surmountable obstacles? This is the question we must ask ourselves. As we go about the task of building a nation of progress, prosperity, and equality, let us bear in mind that we are at the same time writing our own history. A history that posterity will either consider worthy of emulation or one that will be condemned for its lack of inspiration and spirit. Youth of Ghana, ladies and gentlemen, we've been offered a test to prove ourselves worthy of inheriting this great nation. It is a test that we dare not fail. Failing will amount to a grave injustice to the memory of all those who sweat, blood, and toil help construct the great nation that has been handed down to us. Even as we acknowledge that more challenges remain to be resolved, there are no reasons for us to slide into purposeless lamentation and self-pity. Rather, they must offer a pivot around which we galvanize ourselves into action. The time has come for us to make a collective push to quicken the pace of our march towards socioeconomic transformation. To do this, we need to shed the garb of the division. We must don the gear of unity. We must respect and love. We, we must achieve respect and love for one another. We must pick up the tools of hard work, and we must plow the fields of challenge in order to sow and nurture the seeds that will enable us collectively reap the fruits of sustainable development. When for centuries past generations waged the relentless struggle for liberation, which culminated in the proclamation of our independence by our Sajifu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah 58 years ago, they were only lighting a flame that shone a bright light on our path to progress and prosperity. Let us not be the generation that dimmed that light. Let the children marching here today and those that will follow say of us and our generation that ours was one that held the flaming torch aloft the highest so that it could shine even brighter to guide their path to the building of an even more prosperous nation. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much for your dedication to our country, and may God bless our homeland, Ghana. Thank you.